Thank you, Luke. Um, so lovely to see everybody. Yeah. Um, so I have five jokes for you guys tonight. It's going to take about 45 to 50 minutes to tell them. Um, but don't worry, it's spread them a lot. So that it's like one joke every 10 minutes or so. So you won't be like left too long without like a funny, funny moment. Um, I want you to think about it, um, like one joke every 10 minutes is it's kind of like the hit rate, the laugh rate of Give My Head Peace. <laughs> it's sort of, uh, it's uh, twice that of Mrs. Brown's voice. <laughs> so if you're a fan of either of those shows, like you're in for a real treat tonight. Um, once every 10 minutes, it's also sort of the rate that um, Jim Astor is on the Stephen Nolan show. <laughs> Um, Stephen Nolan um, came out last year and said, uh, I think this is the biggest show in the country, biggest show in the country, biggest show in the country. And Stephen Nolan came out last year and said, uh, kind of self-mocking because of like, like his, his size, said like, I put the big in biggest show in the country. And I think we can all imagine exactly what part of that Jim Allister puts in. <laughs> and it's not the word show. <laughs> So that's the first <laughs> joke tonight. I'm not going to do the work for you. It's... The jokes are there. Um, it's sort of just the start of the set, so I'm happy to walk back over it again. So, um, I know that most of you were... Okay, so... Um, some of the jokes will be tricky. Okay, you're gonna need to... They're there, some of them are hidden. Um, look, okay, so I, just in case this happened, I have a special guest uh, waiting in the wings, just in case like, I sort of need that extra like, help for you guys to like, find the jokes. Could you please, are you ready? Yeah! Put your hands together, welcome back our special guest! <laughs> you know, like the, this famous, famous actor, Russell Crowe. <laughs> Weird. Like, I, see, everyone else is sort of like laughing at that, because like the, like it's, it's the Crow is called Russell Crowe, but also like Russell Crowe is an actor. <laughs> have you, have you seen, um, have you seen Gladiator? <laughs> so like Russell Crowe was like the main. The main actor in Gladiator, it's like the like the protagonist of, of Gladiators. <sighs> father, father, to a murdered son, husband. To a, uh, I will have my vengeance. It's uh, it's pretty big. Um, but don't worry, it's, not, it's fine. You don't need to know. Okay, so that's Russell Crowe. He's an actor. So the uh, Russell Crowe is here to like. Um, is he the insider? <laughs> okay, so. So Russell Crowe is also like the... It's all right, okay. So Russell Crowe is also like the... He's like the main... He's like the protagonist of The Insider. It's like a movie about tobacco lobbying. Um, he's a real actor. I didn't just make him up. He's like a real actor. And, uh, some of these people know who... Uh, these people over here as well. Um, but he was like... He was the main... The main... So... <laughs> Have you seen Noah? <laughs> so, like the, so, so Russell Crowe was in Noah. It was a, it was a movie about like Noah, like Noah's Ark. Um, Darren Aronofsky made it. He's very famous. He's like the main. He's sort of the main. He's the main, he's the protagonist. No, he's Noah. He plays Noah in Noah. <laughs> and, um, so it was a bit. It's a big movie. Um, and it's just um, yeah. <laughs> Like Robin Hood. <laughs> so there was a second, it's not good, the Prince of Thieves one, well, there's another Robin Hood, it was 20, 2016 or something like that there. So Russell, Russell Crowe is, is Robin Hood. Not just like, a, he's like he is the, the protagonist, the main character. I agree against the British or something like that there. <laughs> most of us. So Russell Crowe is in, in that. And okay, so what's happening here is 
Like I, I have brought the, the crow on to sort of aid um, some of the difficult bits in the set, but it seems like it's starting to get more confusing. So, um, and the worry here for me is that there's a lot in this set that is actually just like animals with people names <laughs> for a significant portion of time. And if we can't get the connection between Russell Crowe the bird and Russell Crowe the actor, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna be in trouble. Um, oh, do I have that? <laughs> like, it's, all, it's all right, you know? It's, it's okay, like this is being recorded. But I can edit it, so I can, like, like I purposefully didn't stream tonight's show um, for this, this reason, so, but it, it, it is edited, so, so don't worry, you have to be able to, like, a, like, I'm not annoyed, I just, like, I'm happy, I'm happy that I'm just, I just want you to be able to get off on the same page as everyone else. Like, just in general, if you hear people laughing at stuff, folks, like, just laugh along, it's... <laughs> Like I said, the, the jokes are kind of there, and everyone else is having a good time, just sort of... Just um, like, I, I have... I... I'm up here... I named the crow Russell Crow. But the, but the crow doesn't have a... It's not a... It's a puppet. Um, I've had... It's had multiple iterations of names, and I, I just kind of picked the one that I thought would be easiest. And, and I, I almost went with with uh, like Bob Crow, famous trade union leader. And <laughs> I very nearly went with Joe Krogan. <laughs> For I, like I, I also thought that sort of abstractly, um, Robin Swan. <laughs> Sort of the name three three birds at the same time. <laughs> the Russell Crowe seemed like the most most reasonable. And this is not really this difficult usually. So okay, so you know how you know how sometimes like people will have like the, the cats and they name those cats like funny people names, right? So uh, so for example, like if a person's a cat, they might call them Chairman Meow. <laughs> right, um, or like Fidel Castro. He's <laughs> always uh, 20th century revolutionary communists. <laughs> Nikita Khrushchev. <laughs> Ho Chi Mittens. <laughs> and what, what I'm doing is like the same as that with the crow. It's like... <laughs> I, so, this is not, so this is not the set, okay? <laughs> like, it's called Elected, it's supposed to be about some political stuff, it's not about, like, the actor Russell Crowe and, like, and the crow, it's just, this is the funny bit in the first minute, sort of with any, everyone on side, and then there's, like, other material that's not related to this, so, it's, it's alright, it's okay, look, we can, we can pick it up again, so, Okay, we're, so let's, let's, let's just let's start this again. All right. So, I feel that the crow is becoming a bit of a distraction. So, uh, like, okay, so was that funny? Was it? <laughs> Distraction. I don't want to ruin the illusion. <laughs> so I'll be right. 
right back. <laughs> and trying to do bits that you think are going to be funny and no one likes them. And you grab the stand with the crow. People buckle over. Try something different. <laughs> Wish I was doing this with the crow. <laughs> Crow's not coming back. <laughs> now there's the gibbon. <laughs> this set was going to start tonight with... The set was supposed to start with the idea of death. <laughs> <laughs> it was... me going to talk about some of my famous political figures, public figures that died. And as, as most of you are probably aware, the crow is the symbol of death. And that was how I was going to tie it all together. <laughs> a couple of uh, weeks ago, over a month ago, the, the Foo Fighters drummer, Peter Hawkins, died. Around about the same time, uh, the singer Mark Lanigan died. Uh, and then also around about the same time, just a couple of days before, the DUP MLA Christopher Salford died. And all these people sort of died around the same time. I was thinking, you know, it would be really nice to, to like have a set where instead of just doing jokes, I kind of got up and talked a little bit about like not the circumstances of the deaths, but like how they were treated by the media, uh, what people said in their, when they were eulogizing them, and just sort of having like a general like reflection on like death and public life and public figures. Um, but that's all fucking left now, isn't it? <laughs> And the crow is the symbol of death, much in the same way that uh, the cats are a symbol of communism. <laughs> or also in many ways like dogs or avatars for the far right. <laughs> and you have a dog, or you know someone that has a dog. <laughs> That person's probably a fascist. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the reason that you find a lot of people name their dogs after prominent members of the DUB. <laughs> I'll say she and Paisley. <laughs> I'll say she and Paisley Jr. <laughs> Nigel Dogs. <laughs> Diane Dogs. <laughs> Arlene Foster a dog. <laughs> Jeffrey Dog 
Wilson. <laughs> I, I wish I could say that that like I had made the names of those dogs up, that that was my creativity. Um, but those dogs are, are actual real dogs. Um, I'm, I've met some of those dogs, with the exception of Arlene Foster, a dog who I, I did make up. <laughs> I'd be a little too too elaborate for someone to name their dog. But those those dogs are real dogs. Those dogs belong to a, like a, a person who used to live uh, around about where my parents is. When I was, I was growing up, he was a farmer, uh, lived nearby, and he was a fascist. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the names of his dogs. Um, when we were kids, you know, you're young, you don't really know much about politics, and so, but we would often go around to the farm. He used to have chickens, and we used to really enjoy, you know, feeding the chickens, running around after the chickens, things that kids do, meeting friends. Um, and all of those dogs would be there. Um, you had like Nigel dogs. So, the Nigel dogs is like the like, like a basset hound, like a droopy, like a type of like scarly sort of like big things, like roar sort of dog. Uh, Diane dogs was a real dog. Uh, Diane dogs uh, is a bitch. It's a female dog. Uh, Alsatian Paisley and Alsatian Paisley Jr. are also, those are real dogs, those are like snarling, angry, vicious, uh, vicious dogs. They would snap at their ankles and stuff, we didn't really like that. Uh, the one that really stands out to me was, uh, was Jeffrey Doggleson. <laughs> Jeffrey Doggleson was... Jeffrey Doggleson was an incontinent dog. <laughs> When we used to go over, Jeffrey Doggleson used to be running around um, and just like skirting around the place like, and, like shit everywhere. <laughs> and it was grotesque. <laughs> it was also a little embarrassing. All right. um, when you looked into Jeffrey Doggleson's eyes, <laughs> You could tell that somewhere deep down there, in his like dog brain or dog soul, that he knew better. <laughs> like it, like, like he was being egged on by the other dogs, <laughs> who just thought it was a great laugh. <laughs> and they did, like, and, like the other dogs would just be in hysterics. Jeffrey Doggleson just like shitting everywhere all over the place. Um, all of the other animals also thought it was pretty funny. There's a bunch of other animals, of course, it was farm. Um, there's a couple of cats on the farm. There was Eamon the cat. <laughs> Jerry Caprol, <laughs> Bernadette Devlin McCaskey, <laughs> a couple of horses as well uh, on the farm, and it wasn't they weren't very imaginatively named, uh, but you had Ian Grizzly <laughs> and Ian Grizzly Jr. <laughs> My neighbor, like I said, was a fascist. It's a racist, sexist, it's a homophobe, it's an anti Semite. Um, but he really loved his puns. <laughs> Every cloud. I think my favorites probably were. It's probably between the sheep and the cows. Okay. The sheep you had. Claire Bali. Baal O'Hara. Stephen Agnew. Which, as everyone here has realized, is a very clever French pun. Yes. The jokes are there. That was the second one. <laughs> no, no, 
not gonna explain it. I'm not gonna do that work for you. I do mean slam in French. <laughs> the cows, cows were, were probably my favorite. So the cows were uh, Frisian. So I don't know if anyone has grown up around a farm. Uh, Frisians are the black and white ones that give milk. You had a couple of Frisians with Frisian hair. They used to uh, sit up in a uh, we used to call free dairy corner. <laughs> Martin Milk Guinness. <laughs> Jerry Adams. <laughs> it's tricky, you know, um, as a stand up. I remember when, um, when Martin McGuinness passed away, I just like, started to do stand up around that time. And there was a question about whether or not, um, or how you do material about uh, you know, people in the public eye. Especially people who have like a sort of controversial history, sort of like liked by some people, loved by others, and um, it was a big thing uh, among the comics at the time about whether or not you could successfully do a joke about Martin McGuinness and how, how you would do that. Uh, and it brought up all sorts of questions about comedy, uh, what the purpose of it was. Was it just like jokes for lads? Could you just like say whatever sort of jokes you wanted as long as people laughed at it, um, or was there something much broader, much like more social about comedy? Uh, and did it mean that whenever you were doing the jokes, you had to think about what the historical context was. You know, what, what, what are people getting from those jokes? Is there some sort of like broader thing within the jokes? It's not just about making people laugh. Maybe you, you're also trying to like put out a certain sort of vibe into the world. Maybe you're trying to create the world that you live in just through the jokes. And so people were thinking about this sort of thing. Um, uh, and it was, it was tough. I don't think there was any like uh, clear answer to that. People were just sort of working through the tensions. Uh, when Martin McGinnis died, um, I remember that in Stormont, the leaders of all of the political parties uh, did a eulogy, or so there was like everyone said their words. Um, like every everyone spoke. Jim Allister spoke. Um, the head of the UUP spoke. Uh, the head of the SDLP spoke. They're all they all had things to say, uh, which are sort of sanit sanitized, basically uh, Martin McGuinness. Whether whether for one way or the other, it wasn't really a reflection. I think of person he was, except for Jerry Carroll. And, and Jerry Carroll very boldly quoted Karl Marx when he was eulogizing uh, Martin McGuinness. What he said was, um, people make history, but not under the circumstances of their choosing. Which essentially means that while you know, people have agency, and while they're like, you know, have some sort of control over their lives and the things that they do, the choices that they make, at the same time, they're sort of constrained, that like agency is constrained by historical forces and social forces, that the way that they act is not maybe how they would act in a different historical time or place. Which I thought was very nice. Um, that quote is from Karl Marx, the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, if I remember correctly. It continues on, that quote, um, if I can remember it now, the tradition of all dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brains of the living. And I decided that given the social context of this, that I'm going to tell a joke about Martin McGuinness. <laughs> <laughs> now, sense the discomfort in the room. And I know that some of you are Catholic. I just want you to know that you're okay. I too am a Catholic. <laughs> so you're in safe hands. <laughs> It'll be fine. Don't worry. I thought about this. <laughs> I am a Catholic. <laughs> Patty Englishman. <laughs> Patty Irishman. Patty Scotchman. <laughs> and Martin McGuinness. <laughs> but I am Catholic, it's a. <laughs> 
it's not just a pit. I am, um, you know, I, I, Paul Nolan isn't really one of those names that go either way. All right, so then you might be like, oh, maybe he is, maybe he isn't, but I am. Um, I, I, Moan is like I'm Gaelic. Um, I don't know how to spell it or pronounce it or what it means in Irish. <laughs> <laughs> it is, uh, it's, def it's definitely an Irish. I'm definitely a Catholic. <laughs> oh. Paddy Englishman. Paddy Irishman. Paddy Scotchman. And Martin McGuinness. We're walking through a field and, uh, like, I love maths, right? <laughs> love maths. A Catholic maths, not Protestant maths. <laughs> Big fan of maths. Big fan of priests. <laughs> Big fan of making my confession regularly. I do it all the time. I am a Catholic. Paddy Englishman, Paddy Irishman, Paddy Scotchman, and Martin McGuinness are walking through a field. I have, <laughs> I power walk all the time. It's like a, for like hours, it's like a very Catholic. I know what it's like to be, I am a Catholic. It's, this isn't a, I, I wouldn't do that, you know. <laughs> Paddy Englishman. Paddy Englishman. Paddy Irishman. Paddy Scotchman. Martin McGuinness walking through a field and like, okay. I don't own a toaster. But if I did, I don't remember which one. The right one, the one where the one where you would put it. I. That's where I would put my toaster. <laughs> yeah, I'm a Catholic. Like, look at these eyes. That's, you know what you're looking for. Yes, ma'am. And it's just fucking hell. <laughs> Seriously, I just want to tell a joke about Martin McGuinness. Like, I, mean, I, under I understand, you know, I understand. It's, I, I also don't blame you, you know, for your dark. It's, it's hard to like know, you know, like especially comedians when they're on stage, whether or not they're telling the truth about things. But the wider world at the moment is just like people who seem to like, they take all the superficial positions about everything and then they change their minds and like they, flip flop back and forwards and like it, coming up and like this election has been really bad for that because you have you have a lot of candidates who, who won't say whether or not they're they're pro choice or not. So you never know when a candidates are like, well we'll wait and see. Okay. Right. Can you imagine any other job where someone was just like wait and see <laughs> right. Can you imagine like boarding the Titanic <laughs> and saying to the captain, you should have like Plenty of lifeboats, don't you? And it's like, well, you're gonna have to. You have to pop on board and out into the ocean before we, uh, before we see how that works out for you. you know? But like, that's what that's what a lot of candidates do. The the SDLP are desperate for it. Yeah. Um, I call them Schrodinger's Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the best joke of the set. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint. Um, they have a bad for Ian. Too, well, at least like Ian too. At least they're very they, they're very clear what they feel about it. Uh, I'm sure you've seen the Ian two posters around in Times Square and every corner. <laughs> in Ian two mugs looking down at you. Um, and I, I I worked out what Ian two stands for. Uh, when I watched the election video, into smart. <laughs> into pretty. 
it's it is it is tough. It's tough to stand up. World is one of those. It's such a world that you know you're you're not really sure like how to take people. Is everything a bit? What are people's positions on things? I remember when I first had my big moment of doubt. It was uh, it was a couple of years ago. It was around about the time Martin McGinnis had died. It was it was Ian Paisley Jr. had just been caught lying in Parliament. He'd taken one hundred thousand pounds worth of holiday bribes from the Sri Lankan government so he could like. Uh, cover up for their human rights abuses. We get caught out. And he's in the House of Commons, I believe, um, and he was gurning his big Ian Grizzly head. <laughs> Ian Grizzly tears, fake tears stream, streaming down his Ian Grizzly head. Uh, he's a very horsey looking man, Ian Paisley Jr. <laughs> Imagine waking up next to Ian Paisley Jr. <laughs> Be like, <laughs> Be like, be like that like scene from The Godfather, you know? <laughs> but no, it was, it was desperate. It's really, it's really hard to know. Um, I, I myself don't really know, as a comic sometimes, like what, what I'm supposed to do, what sort of identity I'm supposed to take on stage. Uh, so when this happened, when the Ian Paisley Jr. Like, scandal happened with the money, uh, that was right about the time I actually did Stan Startup. Stan Startup? Started Stand Up. That's kind of the same. Um, so I started Stand Up around about that time, and my very first set, 10 minute set, and it was about Ian Paisley Jr., and it was about this particular scandal. And I'll, I'll, I'll just run you through the basics of the set. So it was 10 minutes, but the punchline was effectively I was trying, I was going to say that Ian Paisley Jr. loved foreign holidays so much. Love being in the public eye so much, was so depressed that maybe he should go on Celebrity Love Island. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's 10 minutes, one joke, right at the very end. Um, it was good, people enjoyed it, people thought it was really funny, um, and so I decided to do a little bit more political humor. Um, uh, Paddy McGuffey, who is a comic from Ballymena, called me up. Paddy was like, you should come out and perform Ballymena. And I said, I would love, love to come out and perform Ballymena. He says, I hear your set's going down really well. Um, it was, it was good, it was a good set. You know, it doesn't, didn't really do it justice there. It's very clever. Very, very clever, so the jokes were there. People laugh. Uh, standing ovation, standing ovation at the end. Just put that out there. Um, <laughs> Wasn't the quality of this set? <laughs> uh, but he asked me out, and um, I decided to go down. Now, if any, I know there's maybe a couple of other stand-up comics here in the audience, a couple of other performers. If you're doing stand-up and you're going to somewhere that is different from the place that you usually perform, then typically what you do is you do at least a couple of jokes about that place. Uh, what most stand-ups do is they'll Google that place if they haven't been there, but they'll ask the local and say, like, what are the, the two most famous things from that place? Right. And the two most famous things in the Balloween are Ian Paisley, <laughs> convenient, and uh, the celebrity actor Liam Neeson. <laughs> well, that was great. The problem was that around the same time, Liam Neeson had got himself into a bit of bother. <laughs> and most of you probably be aware of this because it made big headlines at the time is that he had been a racist. <laughs> and what he'd done was he had um, been going around giving uh, interviews about Taken, I believe was the movie that was coming out, or Taken 2 or Taken 3, one of the Takens. And somebody said to you, well, how, like, how do you get into character for your role in Taken? And he said, well, actually, and this is true, it's absolutely true. Said, well, you know what? I, like a friend of mine was assaulted once, uh, and that person told him that it was a black person who done. And so what he did was that he went out looking for black people to beat up. It's true. It's absolutely, it's absolutely true. Yeah, no, it is. That's exactly the right response. It's totally true. And here's exactly what he said. This, this is this is not. This is true. Um, I've uh, edited this, by the way, just so like to get out the more uh, gruesome aspects of this. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is totally true. There were some, and this is an, an interview reporter said this to him, and I went to go, like headline news, and everyone would talk about it afterwards. There were some nights I went out deliberately into black areas in the city 
So I can unleash physical violence. That's what he said. Um, this reaction shocked and hurt me. So he said it, but then he's also saying, well, I shouldn't have done that. You know? The reaction shocked and hurt me. I did seek help. I went to a priest and aired my confession. I am a Catholic. <laughs> Power walking helped me. <laughs> Two hours every day. Now this is true. So rather than be a callback, about 10 minutes ago, I called into the future. <laughs> it's a very clever <laughs> comedy technique. It doesn't garner you, garner you as many laughs. <laughs> but it's very, very satisfying to do. Um, it's true. Uh, I am a Catholic. I am a Catholic. Power walking helped me. <laughs> With the old racism. <laughs> Two hours every day, just to be sure, I am not a racist. <laughs> now, of course, like, uh, when this came out, everyone, people all over the world were saying, well, that's still, it's still pretty racist. <laughs> like, it's all right to say, I'm not a racist. I'm sorry. And another one to, like, go into black areas looking for, like, black people to, like, to be up, right? It's definitely racist. And um, there's a lot of problems with this, right? He then said, and then this, is, this is a separate interview where he was saying, like, do you, have you thought about what you've said? <laughs> do you want to change any of it? <laughs> Just to be clear here, I think there is something to be said for people who acknowledge the parts of themselves that have done wrong. Okay, so, and it's probably better that people are more honest about the things that they've done or the thoughts that they've had, but they then afterwards are like, well, that was wrong, and I, and I regret that, and they just cover it up and say, no, I've never had any racist thoughts about people, or I've never had any sexist thoughts. It's another thing to like actually say it, and I mean it. That's why I actually believe that Liam Neeson was like, he meant it in the interview. He was like, I, I'm sorry, and I'm like, this, this was wrong. He's still a racist, or he had racist thoughts, but it, it, he was trying to do the right thing. And in the second interview, he said, I said, do you want to like, think about what you said? And he said, no, no, it's like, I, I am not a racist. He said, if it had been an Irish, a Brit, a Scot, or a Lithuanian, I would have had the same reaction. And I said, come on, a couple of questions here. The first thing I'm just like amazed that Liam Neeson has like some sort of scoreboard of whiteness. <laughs> <laughs> and on that scoreboard, you have the Irish at the top, <laughs> the Brits, by which I think he means England and Wales. <laughs> Isle of Man. So close, close second. Um, Scotland, third, third most white. And then Lithuania. The fourth, fourth big white country. We all think about. I don't find any of those people who would have went after them. And now I have another question about this. Can we, can we, can we really imagine Liam Neeson? Maybe he or someone else was attacked by a white person looking for white people <laughs> to beat up. I don't think we can. <laughs> and I think this is the essence of the racism of Liam Neeson, and even though he was trying to The essence of it is that to, to confuse like, an individual, concrete, specific individual, and then to like, apply the behavior of one individual to a whole social, ethnic, racial, great group of people like that is a racist thing to do. Whether or not you don't think that you're a racist because you don't want to uh, enact violence afterwards on those people, is that still makes what you say racist? Okay. Oh. Now, I, when doing my stand-up, want to be able to do material that I think has uh, some social benefit. There's something social going on. It's not just about comedy. And so, Paddy McGaffey asked me to do this gig. I said, "Well, I can do it, but I, I, I was going to do a joke about Liam Neeson, but I feel like I'm not able to do that. I'm not like good enough to be able to handle the situation correctly. I can't do a joke." about Liam Neeson and racism 
it's just it's impossible. You know, it'll come off track. And he said, that's okay. He said, just do a joke about something else. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to do my whole set about Ian Paisley Jr. <laughs> Paddy said, nah. Right. He said, not in Balmina. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> <laughs> that's the fun. That's not one of the <laughs> one of the jokes. It's a fr freebie there. <laughs> he said you can't. You won't be able to get away with that in Valamina. I, I don't like him sense. And I said, are you sure I can't do jokes about about Ian Paisley Jr.? I said, Patty, look, you know, I know that there's a largely Protestant audience down there, but you don't have to worry because I'm a Protestant. <laughs> still can't do jokes about Ian Paisley Jr. in the Paisley Jr. heartland, the Paisley heartland. And you won't be able to, you won't get away with it. You'd be lynched, desperate, you'd be, you'd be thrown out. You'll never do comedy again. I said, Patty, are you censoring me? He's like, I can't, I, I love what you're doing, and I won't do that, I won't censor you, but I just need to know, you need to know the risks. So I went to the gig in Ballymena. And I got up in front of the crowd in Ballymena. I look, not much, much like the crowd here, you know, no, it's about as many people. Same type of venue, it's kind of small, it was the back of a bar. It was going quiet and dark. Uh, it was nice. And a couple of comics on before me, they were very good, and I got off and I just started launching into the material. I, I said, people of Balamina, I've come here tonight to do material about one of your own. <laughs> I said, about a megalomaniac. <laughs> I said, it's about a man who wants to bring us back to the past. By the traditional ways. He's <laughs> crazy, do anything to do with every, whatever it takes. I said, yeah, I'm doing material about Liam Neeson and Batman Begins. <laughs> That I'm not, I, I, I'm here, comrades. <laughs> I'm Balamina tonight. Talk to you about uh, your sons, one of Balamina's sons. You know, who has, you know, known connections with paramilitaries. <laughs> Says Liam Neeson. <laughs> the A team. <laughs> Like friends, friends, Balamina, I'm I'm here tonight to do material about your favourites, one of your favourites, person you love, here naked and vulnerable tonight in front of you to do this material. I'm going to do material about one of you who purports to hate foreigners, but loves to take visits across all of Europe. And I said, yeah, they knew, they knew they were like it. Liam Neeson. <laughs> In Taken. <laughs> Taken 2. In Taken 3. <laughs> I said, people of Balamina, I'm up here burying my soul tonight. I'm here, very controversially, doing material about someone that, that you treasure. Someone that purports 
to care about Jews, but actually cares only about lining their own pockets. I said, yes, that's Liam Neeson in Schindler's List. <laughs> oh, and the people of Balamina, they loved it. <laughs> they lifted me up. <laughs> they carried me around the bar. <laughs> They've never been so touched. Loved it. <laughs> they were just, you feel the love in that room. It was a great room. It was weird though, I was just being carried out. It's just sort of dark enough that you kind of kind of see people. There's one person not laughing. There's one single person not cheering. There's no jubilation in their eyes. Couldn't really see who it was. And they were sort of like ashen faced, kind of in shadow. Um, and I realized afterwards that it was the celebrity actor Liam Neeson. <laughs> He did not appreciate the set. <laughs> Had a few drinks, hung up with some of the other comics. It was a good time. And then I decided, right, it's time to, time to go home. You know, time to head back to Belfast. I was going out to my car, I was heading down, and down the street, speak. Fucking billboard poster thing of Ian Paisley's, Ian Grizzly head on it. <laughs> right under it, sort of like a shaded, shadowy area. And as I was walking past it, sort of dimly lit enough the street, and as I'm walking past it, I see like a flame, it's like a lighter. And then I see the lighter move upwards, and I see the embers of a cigarette, sort of like making that little like, like embery, like flickery flame thing. Somebody with a cigarette, and out of the shadows, Step Liam Neeson. <laughs> and he power walked across the road. It's <laughs> fucking quick as lightning. <laughs> and about, about yeah, yeah, far away from me. It's pretty, pretty close. Like. I said, do you know who I am? I said, yeah, you're a celebrity actor, Liam Neeson. <laughs> Star Batman Begins. <laughs> the A Team. Taken. Taken two and Taken three. And Schindler's List. He said, yeah. He said, well then you know that I have a very specific set of skills. <laughs> and quick as a flash, he kicked me in the shins and fucking legs. <laughs> And I saw her very weak shin, so I was freaking sore and like it. <laughs> and sat there, I was like, stood there, I was not really sure what to do. And it's just a weird coincidence, but at the same time, like an unmarked uh, police car came past. Um, and like a, a policeman jumped out of it, he saw that I was sort of hobbling, and he was like, are you okay, sir? I said, I think I've just been assaulted. And he said, well, did you see what the attacker looked like? <laughs> <laughs> and in that moment, I thought, I have two options here. <laughs> Get Liam Neeson, or I can make a broader social rhetorical point and feel like really smug about it. <laughs> I chose the latter. I said, I did see the person that attacked me, officer. He said, okay, can you give me a description? And I said, well, it's gonna be difficult. Because instead of being an individual, it was an entire social racial collective. <laughs> the police officer said, well, that's, that's not what really happens. Can you, can you be a little bit more specific? And I said, yeah. I said, it was star, the protagonist, of every male revenge fantasy movie was mediocre from 2003. <laughs> and the police officer said, oh, it was Liam Neeson. <laughs> now, <laughs> it's the fourth. Uh, 
was sad. <laughs> Didn't get to finish my Martin McGuinness one, so they get so kind of a spore. Um, <laughs> it's a hard way to end. So whenever, whenever I planned this set, I was like, this will be the joke that I end on. It's a very clever callback to a bit earlier in the set. And I'm like, this, this is so good, so funny. But also in my head, I'm aware that it doesn't get the laugh it deserves. <laughs> and it's a very unappreciated joke. But I knew this going into it, and I was like, well, I need to have something else after that, you know. Uh, the reason that I think that it is underappreciated is I think that there's a little bit too much Hegel in it. <laughs> it has this whole like philosophical, like individual, concrete, particular, you know, universal thing to it. And I don't think that we have talked enough or at all about Hegel in this set. <laughs> So I'm going to do a joke about uh, the 18th century philosopher Hegel. <laughs> and I know that there's a few Hegelian Marxists in the audience. <laughs> I just wanted to say, don't worry. <laughs> it's okay. You're in safe hands. <laughs> For I am the Geist, <laughs> the world spirit, yes. Hegel's conception of history. I'm the identical subject object, <laughs> the abstract concept, and therefore perfectly suited to do jokes about Hegel. I am, I am an abstract concept. There's the problem with this. I didn't have time to write my Hegel joke. <laughs> and uh, just never sort of planned this plan this gig was sort of a rush. I wanted to get my, my DUP stuff out before uh, before the election. Um, because I wasn't sure how I'd be able to use it afterwards if the DUP, they, if they do well. Right, and they're not really expected to, but they do. People aren't gonna wanna hear jokes about the DUP. People aren't gonna wanna hear about the DUP. I was like, I really need to get this set out there. Um, so it was a bit of a rush, and then this week I thought, well, okay, I can't really end on the excellent but underappreciated Liam Neeson <laughs> joke. I could, but I wouldn't feel good about it. So I'll write this joke for him. <laughs> um, but I just, I was flat out, no, no, fine. Um, and that's a real pity. Uh, I tried, I did try. I went home, I, 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 it's hard for me to like think about these things in the city, there's a lot of distractions. So what I did was I, I called my, my dad and I said, can I come home? For a day or two, I have this like material I need to write, and I sort of need to be out the countryside, countryside air, all this sort of stuff in order to be able to like properly think about it. And he says, sure, come back. So I, so I went home, and I was going to have two days to try and write the joke that would end this set. Um, and I got away with it. All right. Because I went out for a walk, <laughs> and as I was going out for that walk, I came across my fascist neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> he was sort of hiding in the bushes, very close to the farm. I haven't seen him in years. Just at the end of the lane, he's kind of hiding there. He said, Paul, 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 are you, are you okay? He said, come, shh, shh, shh. So I went over and I said, what's up? He said, it's chaos. He said, the dogs have taken over the farm. <laughs> he said, it's positively Kafka-esque. <laughs> no, they're underappreciated. <laughs> it's positively Kafka-esque, he said. And I said, okay, what's... What, what are we going to do? He said, I don't know, he said, it's, 
He said, I feel really bad. And so the tent like explained to me exactly what has happened. He said, they they just they took over. He said, there's a bu- it's a bunch of them. We sort of like, we looked up and we had these steam glasses, binoculars with them. He passed me the binoculars and we looked up at the farm. And there's two dogs that I hadn't seen before. <laughs> One of them was holding the other like this. And I said, what do you call that big dog? And he said, um, that's Jim Alastation. Another <laughs> <laughs> Alastation. He's holding his other dog back like this. And this little dog's like scrappy dude. And like he's spinning his arms around, wants to get into her eye, tiny, tiny wee puppy. And I said, what do you call the smaller dog? And he said, that smaller dog's in charge. <laughs> call that dog, Jimmy Bryce, son of a bitch. <laughs> I said, well, we'll just have to, we can wait a month. The dogs, you just like, well, we'll just have to wait here, they'll, they'll, they'll die down. And, and you can start to see, like, they start to burn things. So it's dusk, so it's, so it's dusk, it's like night is falling, or, uh, and you can start to see like flames and embers and things, and you can hear wild, wild noises. You just about to see the silhouettes of the dog at this point. Um, and he said, they've got, um, Enough wood burning stoves. <laughs> In this place to last forever. <laughs> Said they're just using the energy flat out, but they're still making tons of cash on it. <laughs> so they'll never run out of resources. Can't wait them out. It's not going to be a very successful war of attrition. So it was, we're gonna have to go in and, and, and deal with it, I guess. And he said, he said, I feel bad. He said, all this time being like a, a racist, a sexist, and a homophobe. And he said, I never really looked outwards. And I saw like, the things in society that were bad, and I just sort of turned a blind eye, you know? And he said, like every multicultural center that was petrol bombed, did like every political candidate from the left that was harassed and their posters torn down. He said like all of the social social problems. He said every uh, migrant family that was chased from their houses, told to leave. He said every every time people would ask for social housing and, and it was denied. He said all those things. I didn't care about any of those things. He said like the wider problems. He said migrants dying in the Mediterranean. He said like these wars and battles happening all over the world was my problem. Um, but now I sort of feel guilty about it. Um, and I, in that moment, felt guilty too. Because I could have I said something, I could have done something, I could have had that conversation with him. Um, but I hadn't done that. It wasn't, wasn't worth my time trying to like, convince him about like, anything. Um, but then we sat there and sort of had this, like, this inspiration. And I thought, what if, in this moment, I can pull on the same dialectic powers connecting the concrete and the universal (laughs) that I was able to do when I explained the Liam Neeson situation to that police officer? (laughs) Can I somehow conjure up enough energy that we can deal with the situation? I reached across to my neighbor and I said, give me your hand. And he gave me his hand. I know you've never given a man his hand before. It's very uncomfortable for him, but he <laughs> did it. We held hands and I said, I need you to trust me. I'm going to close your eyes and you'll be okay. We'll get away out of this. So we closed our eyes and we held hands and really, really firmly. So we felt this great swell of energy and I'm stuck. And I opened my eyes. It's dark. And across this field, I saw this like glow. You know, like in like Star Wars, you know, when the ghosts come back, this is sort of like glow around. We saw this. Then we make it out. There's four figures started walking towards us. 
And then, I don't know, I didn't really see it, but I knew intuitively who it was. <laughs> the jokes were there. <laughs> Not gonna make it easy. <laughs> you know who it was? Patty English, man. <laughs> Patty Irish, man. <laughs> Paddy Scotchman <laughs> and Martin McGinnis. <laughs> and they walked towards us. And as they walked towards us, three of them split off towards the farm. And the one that was Martin McGinnis kept on walking towards us. I turned to my neighbor and I said, it's okay. These guys all have very uh, special skills. <laughs> <laughs> he said, what do you mean? Well, I said, we might not have noticed. But Paddy Englishman is Robin Hood. <laughs> as played by Russell Crowe. <laughs> Paddy Irishman. Well, that was Michael Collins. <laughs> as played by Liam Neeson. <laughs> Paddy Scotchman. Well, that's Mel Gibson. <laughs> it's Braveheart. He <laughs> said, those, those guys have skills. They've all fought parody, they've all fought against the English, they've all fought for what was right. Um, and Mark McGuinness came over and he sat down beside me and said, it's going to be okay. And I said, I know it is, because between those three and their violent revolutionary deeds, they're going to clear out that farm and all those criminal dogs inside it. And Martin McGinnis said, no, that's not what's gonna happen. Not tonight. <laughs> he said, because within each of those is a weird tension. He said, yes, you have that spirit, revolutionary spirit of Braveheart, William Wallace, but you also have that spirit Mel Gibson. <laughs> he said, you have Michael Collins' revolutionary spirit, but you also have that racist tension. Liam Neeson. <laughs> and he said, finally, you have the one that I've forgotten. Ah, yes! Robin Hood. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, um, the sexist Russell Crowe. <laughs> So they are both good and bad. There is no pure hero, all right? There is no totally evil person. It was that instead of having this battle, angry, aggressive battle tonight, we're gonna to have a dialogue, we're gonna go in there, and the tensions will be resolved, and politics isn't easy. So we're gonna have a discussion about it. And he said, but it's in the organization, the coming together of a group of people, working together, is what will solve the problem. Just as he said, it. The embers stopped burning, it became morning all of a sudden, and the dogs disappeared. Off to wherever dogs go, <laughs> they don't have a farm. Martin McGinnis disappeared. Now, there's no punchline for that bit. <laughs> but it's very, very clever. <laughs> I can't leave you on that as much as I would like to. So I will end tonight on the five DUP dogs that couldn't make the cuts. We have 
Joanne Runtin, <laughs> Edwin Poodle, <laughs> Emma Little Pen Collie, <laughs> Staffy Wilson, <laughs> and my personal favorite but not good enough to make it in, Paul Gerben. <laughs> Absolute pleasure performing in front of you tonight. What a lovely, warm audience and faces that I can see. Can you, can you please put your hands together as well for the other comics tonight? We have Leo Nardi. This has been my pleasure here tonight, and it was five jokes. <laughs> um, thank you very much. I'm heading for a pint. You're all welcome to join me. Have a good rest of the night. Thank you very much. <laughs>